I'm going to potentially let this particular video run a little long because I want to finish up with touch so I can just get started a little bit with with taste. Um, so this is the cutaneous senses. We're in part two uh, talking about touch. And I'm just, so I want to put us back where we were a little bit with this review of how those peripheral nerves. So when I'm being touched on the finger, that information is going through the dorsal root to the spinal cord going up the medial lemniscal pathway up on the same side getting to the medulla crossing over to be contralateral getting into the ventrolateral nucleus of the thalamus contralateral side to the somatosensory cortex on the contralateral side where i'm actually doing the feeling of my body and where we saw that homunculus that body map or somatotopic map I like to include this picture when I start talking about perceiving details and I usually have people just uh, ask you and so think about this have you ever have you ever tried to read Braille so when I was a kid um, I was legally blind by the time I was six years old definitely they found it and I was already set at such a state where they said she's probably been legally blind for a few years so I really did not see well and every time we went to the eye doctor my mother would cry because my eyes would be so much worse every time we went um, and so that scared me and so uh, she kept kind of with her own fears telling me that uh, they one day they weren't gonna have glasses for for how bad my eyes might get as this fear of hers and so I grew up pretty afraid that I might not be able to see one day and so I used to practice uh, turning off the lights or closing my eyes and um, walking around and I also used to just try to read Braille well reading Braille takes a lot of practice and it, you're really only going to do it if you are in fact uh, blind and what we see with people who are reading Braille is that visual cortex, they're not getting stimulation to the visual cortex because they are blind, and that um, reading Braille actually activates the visual cortex. But I do want to suggest that you go to the elevator or wherever where you can feel the Braille. It is um, really, really impossible to feel the difference between, say, uh, B and K or something like that, or C and uh, E. Just There's just, that's really hard uh, and for a sighted person to read Braille. Now, when we start to talk about perceiving details, uh, one thing that's important is measuring tactile acuity. And what we really want to know is how, so now it's not just detecting some stimulus, but how detail, how much detail can we get from a stimulus? And they do this in a number of ways. One is a two point threshold. So uh, where we have uh, two toothpicks or something and actually these this touch is one of the um, talks and times when I start doing a lot of in-class activities that we're not going to be able to do but if you want to do this with someone it really would help uh, this is a time again when I pair up students and get you to um, get two toothpicks and do this minimum separation on the fingers but before you can finally see oh yes I can tell that those are two separate points and they don't just feel like one point somewhere in the middle and to do that on the arm so the two point threshold what's the minimum separation between two points on the skin where we can feel or perceive that these are two separate points another thing they do is grading acuity so just like we saw the gradings uh, with the visual information and we're saying which which orientation can we see uh, they do this with um, with little gratings where they, they you might feel this with your finger and what's the narrowest spacing of a grating where we can still judge the orientation of that grating. Another thing they use is raised patterns, often something like a letter or something. I'm not sure if we're going to do this e-reserve article where sometimes um, sometimes we do an e-reserve article where they they feel raised letters with their tongue and talk about the tactile acuity of the tongue. Uh, but so they'll have some kind of raised pattern not always letters but um some kind of raised pattern uh, and how small can we make that where you can still identify the pattern or the letter here's just one example of um a figure that's showing us two point thresholds 
for males on different parts of the body. And for females, we see a similar pattern where um, remember that if the threshold is lower, sensitivity is higher. So in the, if you can kind of see in the face and in the hands, and then at one place down at the feet, we have um, lower thresholds or better sensitivity. And as we get into the trunk of the body or um, the forearm, our, we have higher thresholds, so less sensitivity. So we're going to talk about some of these mechanoreceptors as we were perceiving details. And it really looks like it's the Merkel receptors uh, that are telling us about details and how one way we can examine this is with patterns. So there's these raised patterns and you can see the bar along the bottom has a particular pattern where there are some little raised areas really close together and then they spread out a bit. OK, and then there are other areas that are, that are raised that are that are longer. And what we see is as a person is uh, feeling that longer area, the Merkel receptor is not really responding as they as we're getting those um, little ridges in there. Uh, the, the Merkel receptor is responding. And if, if the ridge is more um, pronounced, so there's not another ridge right next to it, the Merkel receptor really responds. So I'm moving from left to right along the bar. And as we get more pronounced and separated, the Merkel receptor responds more strongly. And when we get into a blank space where there's no change, the Merkel receptor really is not in that area is not responding. So that's telling me that pattern is influencing the firing of the Merkel receptors. If we look at the Pacinian corpuscles and we're, we are measuring their activity to that same uh, pattern, you can see that the Pacinian corpuscles are responding the same regardless pretty much of where we are on that pattern. So they're not really giving us, and this is a person just having that, having this pushed against their hand, or pushing their hand against this. So if we're keeping our hands still, that Pacinian, those Pacinian corpuscles are not responding. And we're going to see with our receptor mechanisms, um, we have better acuity uh, for in different areas of our body, really in our um, in our fingertips and our tongue and so forth. And better acuity is associated with a number of things. OK, so I'm going to go through a number of things that influence how how sensitive we are, how acute our sensitivity is. Uh, one is less spacing between the Merkel receptors. And so if we're moving along um, the Y axis, we're looking at tactile acuity. And the, um, remember, as I, my threshold's going down, my sensitivity is going up. So as I'm feeling with my fingertip, I have a lot of acuity. As I feel with the base of the finger, I have less acuity. And as I feel with my palm, um, I have even less acuity. And along the X axis is showing the spacing, the, re the spacing between those Merkel receptors. And in the fingertip, they are much closer together. And as we move to the base of the finger, they're farther apart and they're even farther apart in the palm. So we can see this direct relationship between acuity and the spacing of the Merkel receptors. But there's more. OK, so there's more to this better acuity. It's not just the spacing between the Merkel receptors being closer, giving us better acuity. We also have cortical mechanisms. So the receptive fields of those neurons in the cortex, where the area on the skin that when we stimulate that area on the skin, it's going to influence the firing rate of a particular neuron. And we're going to see smaller receptive fields, right, when we are going to give us better acuity, just like we saw with vision. Those, those neurons that are responding to uh, less information, so have that more direct wiring like the cones, they're going to have um, better acuity. They're going to give us detailed information. So if we look at our receptive fields on our fingers, you can see that those are really small. And we're going to move out to our hand. They get larger and they are overlapping. This is exactly what we saw from, with, from going from the cones in A to the rods in B, or really maybe the, the cones in the periphery in B, and then the rods in C. If we move out to the arm, uh, there the receptive fields are even larger and there's even more overlap. And so if we look at how that translates into brain activity, and so we have two, those two points. I'm looking at a two-point threshold. As I, if I have a, my two points that are pointing there to the hand uh, are two different um, receptive fields, and of they, they're hitting two different receptive fields. And if you notice those in those little circles, there are receptive fields 
there that are between those two points and so that activity is going to uh, bear out in the cortex right where we can see if we look at the activity of the two points on the finger and read that where the, those areas that are stimulated by those two points are going to be separated in the cortex because of the receptive fields and if we look at the arm with those overlapping receptive fields and we have those two points and so he has two points pointing to the arm in C and those two points are the same distance as the two points that are hitting the finger but now those are in those overlapping receptive fields and so if we look at how that gets how that gets translated at the level of feeling this in the brain uh, people are going to feel that as one point somewhere in the center of that because there are no uh, receptive fields in between separated receptive fields in between those that we can separate those in the brain so the other thing that's also so influencing and is related to those receptive fields being smaller for the fingers and larger in the arms is that we have more cortical space for the that are represent that's representing the fingers and we have less cortical space that's representing the arms with those overlapping large receptive fields and again this is this is what we saw with vision right that we had the fovea had cortical magnification we had a lot of we had um, linear wiring and small receptive fields uh, and we got to the brain and we had more cortical space dedicated to the fovea all of those things together gave us the detailed vision where we're moving our eyes around the world well that all of this together is giving us more detailed information from our fingers from our lips from our from our tongue than um, other areas of our of our body where the receptive fields are larger and overlapping and we have less cortical space devoted so we've talked about perceiving details we're actually going to get back to perceiving details but we're going to uh, take this break to talk about vibrations because that's important actually for perceiving details as well uh, in a different in a really different way uh, so the Pacinian corpuscles are how we feel vibrations if you remember me going through the mechanoreceptors and talking about the Pacinian corpuscles as giving me uh, the feeling of my refrigerator running or the feeling um, my uh, my car running or whatever or my key going brr, brr, that those vibrations are felt by the Pacinian corpuscles and how we know how Pacinian corpuscles work comes from work from uh, Werner Lowenstein back in 1960 where if we look at a uh, if they gave a rapid vibration we see that the nerve ending this this if you see the bare nerve ending it is surrounded by what looks kind of like an onion but what's in that onion looking thing is uh, is a liquid and so sometimes I compare this to a waterbed if you feel a uh, vibration on a waterbed you're going to keep feeling that well that's what's happening when we feel a vibration uh, that liquid keeps moving and and vibrating and so that bare nerve ending is what's sensing sensing that okay so it's going to keep responding if we have continuous pressure just like if someone gets on your waterbed and they they sit down you're going to feel it when they sit down but then it's going to stop right you're not going to feel it anymore and so continuous pressure uh, if you look uh, we don't feel that at the bare nerve ending we only feel it when it starts and when it stops so when it comes on and when it goes off and so what Lawrence Lowenstein did was he pushed at a and noticed that this um, what the Pacinian corpuscles uh, fiber nerve fiber there it responded when we started the push and when the push came off and then he um, dissected this it kind of took off that surrounding area and went in and pushed at B so pushed uh, at directly at or stimulated directly at that nerve ending and it responded constantly to the stimulation at B so what it's doing is it is responding to 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 the stimulate when it is stimulated but because of this kind of liquid around it that it's being stimulated only when something starts and when st something stops just like when someone gets on and off your waterbed uh, or so uh, if so what it tells us about is vibration and for the Pacinian corpuscles specifically fast vibrations So part of telling the details of an object is, or perceiving the details of an object, is perceiving the texture 
of an object. And this is where we really use both, it looks like, our Merkel receptors and our Pacinian corpuscles. Uh, and it looks like uh, we use two different cues. And so this is, has been referred to more recently as the duplex theory of texture perception. And Mark Hollins has done a great deal of work on this with several colleagues. But this duplex theory of texture perception, really the crux of the theory was proposed back in 1925 by David Katz, who suggested that we use spatial cues, so those relatively large surface elements, those bumps or grooves uh, that we uh, feel when um, the skin is moved across the surface, but also when it's pressed on to elements, okay? So when I'm pressing something onto the skin, when we saw that weird raised pattern uh, back and we looked at the Merkel receptors, those, are, th those were spatial cues, right? As we're just feeling that um, pattern. Sometimes what I do is I pull out the um, a notebook. And so you might wanna do that with one of your notebooks. As you feel the top of the notebook, you can feel the entire thing the pattern of there's it's just smooth, right? But if you turn your notebook so that you're feeling the wire edges, you can feel uh, how close, to some, to some extent, how close together those wire edges are. And now you can also feel this, it's not smooth, right? Those are um, jagged kind of edges. So we're using those spatial cues, the bumps and grooves, but we're also using what he called temporal cues. So cues that we're using really across time uh, or the information about the specific vibration due to movement over the surface. And so now if you're gonna take your notebook again and you wanna feel across the top, there's not really much about a change over time. You're not really getting information that's changing for that temporal cue. And so you can tell that it's smooth, but if you go back to your wire, that um, wire binding and move across that, you can you can feel again how, and you can do this with different notebooks of, have, that have different wire binding, you can start to feel uh, based on the vibration, how uh, how close together those wires are, and that it's not smooth, it's it's bumpy. So you're getting both of those pieces of information to tell you about the texture of an object. Okay, so for perceiving texture, the, um, this is a study by I think it was Mark Collins and um, Ryan Reisner, uh, and they did some adaptation. So remember we've talked about before the, the slowly adapting. When, when we are slowly adapting, what's happening there is neural fatigue, right? That's what we mean by the adaptation, as opposed to uh, the rapidly adapting corpuscles here that are, that are responding to on-off. That's really two different ways of talking about um, how these neurons are adapting. And it's a little bit confusing, but it is, it is what it is. That's the way it's talked about. So uh, if we look at, um, what they were having people do in this study is they participants were running their hands over a standard texture and a test texture and people were indicating which texture was finer okay which one had was uh, had um, finer kind of grains of sand or whatever in this case for example and um if you notice so if i'm comparing two and i'm saying which is finer if i'm at 50 percent I am at chance, if I'm at 50% 50, 50 accuracy or 50% correct, I'm at chance level. And they had a number of adaptation conditions, one where there was no adaptation. They had the first adaptation condition where the skin was vibrated at 10 vibrations per second or 10 hertz. They did this for six minutes, so fatiguing those neurons. And in this case, um, they're fatiguing the Meissner corpuscles. So if you remember, the Meissner corpuscles are uh, responding to something like hand grip, but they, so they are responding to uh, those changes, those pretty slow changes. Or, so these slow vibrations are going to um, fatigue the Meissner corpuscles. In the second adaptation condition, the skin was vibrated at 250 hertz. So this more like a more like a vibration, like a hand vibrator or um, your car running or something like that. And so in this case, they are fatiguing the Pacinian corpuscles. Okay, and if we look at the um, results. So looking at the figure, uh, if there was no adaptation, people could tell the difference between those textures. They were about a little bit over 75% accurate. If we look at the adaptation of the Meissner corpuscles, so RA1 eliminated is how that is um, denoted there. So sometimes Meissner corpuscles are rapidly adapting one. Pacinian corpuscles are talked about as rapidly adapting two. It's just their other name. So RA1 is eliminating the 
uh, Meissner corpuscles or fatiguing the Meissner corpuscles, and people are just as good at telling the difference between these two textures. And if we look at the second adaptation condition where the Pacinian corpuscles were eliminated or adapted, then we see now people are at chance. So it looks like really for us to tell the difference between those textures, we are using these what we we're going to call temporal cues or the vibrations or that what's changing over time. And if we don't, if we don't have the Pacinian corpuscles, we can't do it. It's the Pacinian corpuscles that are allowing us to um, feel that texture. Research on temporal cues has also found that we can sense vibrations using a tool. So if you think about running a pen over the back of your notebook uh, and we can sense a surface remotely uh, by the vibrations that we feel in that tool. And basically what we're feeling, right, is the tool vibrating and we interpret that uh, in our brains as texture. For perceiving objects, it's good to distinguish between active touch, where we're, we are exploring an object, usually with our fingers and hands, um, moving uh, our hands around haptically, and this kind of haptic perception of three-dimensional objects as we're exploring with our hand. We do explore, as I've already, already said, young kids, uh, toddlers, and so forth, explore more often with their tongue, but we might explore our food with our tongue. If you've ever um, walked on the beach and really kind of felt the sand between your toes and felt through that, you're, you're to some extent you are exploring the, the feeling of the sand, uh, we could call it that, but usually this is with our fingers and hands. And we distinguish that from a, a passive touch where someone's really touching something, applying something to our skin. And we talk about these kinds of touch really differently as, we, as we're doing an active touch, we usually talk about the object or that that um, sensation is belonging to the object. Whereas with passive touch, we usually say things like, that feels sharp. We're talking about the perception and the feeling of this on our skin. Uh, I'm gonna read the example from page 347. I usually have a student do this. Uh, this is these last um, chapters of the book, uh, touch and pain and taste and smell is where I really feel like everything got the most interactive and was the most fun in my classes, which is one of the reasons I flipped all this around and uh, did the higher level vision later. But uh, I'm going to have to read this, uh, and I'm going to. This is um, uh, Girat Vermage, I'm not, I don't say his name right, who is uh, blind at the age of four from a childhood eye dis disease. And he is now uh, the Distinguished Professor of Marine Ecology and Paleoecology at UC Davis, the University of California, um, Davis. And he is being interviewed uh, for uh, Yale Graduate School uh, Biology Department, and he's blind. So these people don't think uh, much of him or that he's, they don't think he could possibly, right, uh, succeed at Yale. So uh, here's what happened as, um, as told by Vermage, 1997. Here's something, do you know what it is? Bell asked me as he handed me a specimen. My fingers and mind raced. Widely separated ribs, parallel to outer lip. Large aperture, low spire, glossy. Ribs reflected backward. It's a harpa, I replied tentatively. It must be a harpa major. Right so far. How about this one? Inquired Bell as another fine shell changed hands. Smooth, sleek, channeled suture, narrow opening. Could be any olive. It's an olive. I'm pretty sure it's Oliva Sayana, the common one from Florida, but they all look alike. Both men were momentarily speechless. They had planned this little exercise all along to call my bluff. Now that I had passed, Bell had undergone an instant metamorphosis. Beaming with enthusiasm and warmth, he promised me his full support. So again, they weren't thinking this blind guy was going to do very well um, in the biology department there, but showing with his haptic exploration and with his active touch that he could identify these shells. If you can imagine doing that, the specific shell, uh, I will tell you one of my, one of my interactive uh, kind of, I don't want to call it a lab, but more of a demonstration is to have a smell lab. It's really a demonstration. And at the same time, a touch lab where you guys feel objects in paper bags where you can't use your eyesight and, and you're trying to dis decide what an object is based on just touch. And I do have a couple of shells in there and people usually say shell 
And then I sometimes have someone say the whelk shell or the conch shell, and I do have an olive shell in there and people, and some people get that. Uh, so we can do this. And I really, I'm going to strongly recommend again that you go do these, you, you go do these kind of labs or demonstrations on your own. And so have somebody put a few objects into paper bags or somewhere where you cannot see them and just explore them with your hands and say to yourself, how am I, how am I doing this? What is my, um, what is my uh, strategy and my haptic exploration? And can I tell what the objects are? And you might decide to do that. So after going through a few of these slides and maybe thinking about all of these things. So we are using pretty much all of our systems together in a cooperative kind of way in order to do this haptic exploration as it's called. Our sensory system, so we're detecting the cutaneous senses, the touch, the temperature, the texture. Um, our motor system as we're moving our fingers and hands around and the cognitive system that is taking in information about the what's coming in from the cutaneous senses about the sense sensations and putting that together with the, the motor system and deciding where to move the hands next and then how the hands move around uh, that kind of proprioception as well as being taken in so that we can figure out what an object is. Susan Lederman and Roberta Klatsky have done a couple of studies looking at these exploratory procedures or these haptic procedures and they discovered that people tended to use a number of specific procedures and so again I usually try and make a pretty big deal about this um, and I usually ask a short answer question about it because we have done this uh, lab interaction interactive kind of um, experiential thing where I try to get you all to really think have I used, and put this on the screen as you're as you're doing it am I using lateral motion am I moving my hand back and forth across the top of something in order to figure out the texture am I using pressure okay to figure out the the shape or the really the buoyancy like what it feels like uh, am I using enclosure which is much more clearly about figuring out the shape am I putting my hand around the entire object to get an idea of the shape and am I doing this kind of contour following where I am moving my hand around the object to figure out both aspects of the shape and really about the the texture of the outside of it as as well and usually People tell me that, that they did try those. Somebody, people give me specific examples of trying those with the different um, different things. And um, I usually have stuffed animals and shells and, and different kinds of things in there that you are gonna kind of use pressure and enclosure so that you are trying these different exploratory procedures, these different haptic procedures. And um, usually I have people tell me a couple of other things that they, that they use. And one example is um, I have this weird, oddly shaped nut that um, people don't know quite what it is because it's really oddly shaped. Um, and so people tell me that they, they ping it <laughs> to hear it. Uh, I can't think of other things that people have said, but so, um, but these are the, these are the basic haptic procedures that Ligerman and Klatsky found. And so you really do want to go through and just have a few things in a bag and, and go through these three, three slides in a row here and say, um, how am I using these different um, systems together, the sensory system, cognitive system, and the motor system? How am I using these different procedures? And to remember that this is really an example of active touch. Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of the physiology, so um, which involves both the, res the responses of the mechanoreceptors as well as the cortical responses. Uh, and the thalamus and, and somatosensory, the primary somatosensory cortex and the um, frontal and parietal lobes. Uh, so if we look at the what's happening with the mechanoreceptors, and he, have, he gives this really nice example, and we kind of saw this with that bar with the raised pattern and how those vertical receptors responded, that the raised patterns that were more isolated had more activity in the Merkel receptors, we see the same kind of thing that if I have like a larger ball so that that ball is touching more of my finger, we're going to have this kind of um, shallower slope and less overall activity. 
of the Mer that Merkel those main Merkel receptors and of, of all the Merkel receptors around it, but really the main ones are we don't we don't have the same kind of slope, and we don't have the same kind of activity in those uh, ones that are really feeling in the center. Whereas if we have a smaller ball, that's going to be touching fewer of the Merkel receptors, and what we're going to see is this real um, steep slope. Okay, as the Merkel receptors that are responding are responding more strongly. Again, I know everybody really wanted to talk about receptive fields again. That is everybody's favorite topic. It's it's not. And I have I've kind of beat it into the ground because it's particularly important when um when we're looking at touch. So if you are interested in um, becoming a physical therapist or any any kind of thing where you're dealing with people's um, bodies and a sense of touch or a sense of pain, these receptive fields are really important to understand. And we see, I think, very interestingly, although um, lateral inhibition is the only way for a sensory system to really work because we want to feel relative uh, the information that's relative to the rest of the world, not absolute information, just like I said with vision. But we see these same kind of center surround receptive fields uh, with an excitatory center and an inhibitory surround. And he's showing that there on the monkey's arm. Um, so as we get a small object, and we just saw this with the ball that goes right and hits in the, that excitatory center, uh, we're going to have a lot of activity as that object gets a lot, a little bit larger and starts hitting some of those uh, receptive that that inhibitory surround, um, we're going to see less activity. And this was measured in the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus. So here we're seeing in the thalamus center surround receptive fields. Does that sound familiar? That should sound familiar. Lateral geniculate nucleus. <laughs> We're going to move out to the cortex, to the primary somatosensory cortex there, S1. Uh, we, we still see some with center surround receptive fields. We have others that respond to more specialized stimulation. Uh, so here's a neuron that responds to, uh, uh, neuron one responds best to a horizontally oriented edge presented on the monkey's hand. So we're measuring from that area, that area of the homunculus that's feeling the monkey's um, upper palm there. And, it, and one of the neurons in there is going to respond best to a horizontally oriented edge. It's not responding as we get farther and farther off of that horizontal, and it's not responding at all when we're getting to a vertical um, oriented edge. Does this remind you of something? This should remind you of something. That's what I have my green question, and so good. I am going to tell you the answer. Um, in neuron two, uh, we see that this neuron responds best when we uh, so we're looking now at the monkey's tip of the finger we have a neuron there that's in that part of the homunculus that responds best this is the same with the palm but just to the example that is going to respond best to a uh, stimulation that is moving in a particular direction across the finger so if it's going um up into the up into the left i'm going to feel that i'm going to have the neural response if it's going down into the right i don't have the neural response so this is reminds you of something I'm hoping this reminds you of something. This should remind you, right, of simple cells and complex cells in the visual cortex that we talked about before, that the, those receptive fields of what the neurons are responding to. We see really similar uh, response in the primary somatosensory cortex. We also see in the primary somatosensory cortex in S1 uh, neurons that are going to respond uh, best when the monkey grasps a particular object and not as well when the monkey grabs different objects. And so in this case, um, we, when that, we have that kind of sharp edge of a ruler, that neuron responds. Uh, and when we put something that's more rounded, like a cylinder in the monkey's paw, uh, that neuron does not respond. And finally, also similar to vision and um, what we would see, for, what we see for hearing, is that um, cortical neurons are affected by attention. Right? We have to be paying attention to something to have uh, much of a conscious experience of it. So, what they did with the monkey was they either had a task where uh, the tactile uh, information was important for the task, which is the red line, 
or they had the monkey, the, the tactile information was in the hand, but the monkey was doing uh, some kind of visually oriented task. So the attention was to the visual task. And what we see is the red line showing us neural response. We see a high firing rate to um, when the monkey is actually paying attention to, for the task, the tactile information. But even though that tactile information is hitting the, the paw or wherever on the monkey, um, if the monkey is doing a visual task and not paying attention to what's happening uh, tactilely, um, then we don't see so much neural response. So finally, a short summary slide to put this all together, because some of this actually happened before the exam. We went through the mechanoreceptors, those sensory receptors, and we went through, um, we discussed the pathways to the brain. We also talked about the brain regions, the thalamus and the primary somatosensory cortex as our, as our main brain regions for um, comprehending the uh, perception of touch. And so we I did a little tiny bit of that as introduction to this, more perception of uh, detail, how we perceive vibrations, actually, and what that tells us about deta detail and what that tells us about texture. As all that really kind of goes together. And then finally putting it all together into the perception of, of objects and some of those procedures that we um, perform in order to perceive objects and to get that information about, about detail. Uh, so uh, from we're going to do a little skipping around in this class now. We're going to go to the chemical senses um, so that we can be ready for the e-reserve journal article discussion next Friday. And that can go on as planned. And then we're going to come back to pain. So our other cutaneous sense that we're going to discuss.